What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Scott Proctor, joined as always by my guy, Matt Morris. And we're back with another episode of Simple Question, but this time we'll have more than one because we've got a special guest joining us today for the first time. He's been covering the Jacksonville Jaguars for ESPN since 2013, Michael DiRocco. Michael, thanks for joining us, my man. How are we doing? I'm doing great. How's everybody else doing? Nah, doing great. I can't complain at all, man. I can't complain. It's a good, good. time to be talking to Jacksonville Jaguars <laughs> after a huge win over the Tennessee Titans on Sunday. Let's hop right into things with this question here because this is something I've been wanting to ask you about. Trevor Lawrence, man, he's been balling. He's been playing really well since week nine in particular. 11 touchdowns to zero interceptions. He's first in completion percentage since week nine in the NFL. Has he proven to you, Michael, that he's a franchise quarterback worthy of that number one overall pick and among the NFL's elite at the quarterback position? Yeah, if we were having this discussion in September, October, I would probably say no. But like you mentioned, some of those numbers over the last uh, you know month and a half, he's been fantastic. And you know, the one thing that, that I wanted to see out of him after the bye week was, hey, put the team on your shoulders and go win some games. Um, and he did that against the, um, the Ravens. You know, he drove them down and they scored the game-winning touchdown with like 14 seconds left. Uh, you know, rallied them from, a, uh, I think, a nine-point deficit in that fourth quarter. And then you go to last week against the Titans. The run game was pretty much non-existent. They couldn't do anything on the ground. So they had to put the game on his shoulders. And he throws for 370, or 368, a career high, three touchdowns, runs for another touchdown. Uh, best game that he's probably played in his career. So um, he is answering every single question I think that people around Jacksonville, including his head coach, had about the kids. So, yeah, he looks every bit the the generational guy that uh, they thought he was. Absolutely. And, I mean, Mike, kind of talking about the future, because there is a lot of hype for this season. I'm sure we're going to dive into their chances to, to maybe get past Tennessee in a little bit. But – uh, obviously, still a lot to look forward to next season and that momentum that they're carrying in. Uh, what do you see them doing in particular with the draft as far as trying to address some holes that they still need to fix? Because some of those draft picks they got this year have been absolutely uh, amazing. So they've been hitting on these guys. Uh, who do you think they're going to go after uh, in this draft? And, and what are your expectations for that? Well, I know that I think at Todd McShay's latest mock draft, they had him taken the, uh, the receiver out of Texas, Christian Johnson. Yeah. I don't think that's the way they're going to go because they have a lot of holes on defense. They've invested a lot of money, guaranteed money. It's like $130 million in guaranteed money over the last two years on defensive free agents and five draft picks in the first three rounds on defensive players. And this defense is still struggling. They don't rush the passer very well. They've got huge holes. The other cornerback opposite Tyson Campbell. So I think those are their two biggest needs that they're going to have to address uh, in the draft. Now, maybe... You know, you could argue corner over pass rusher either way, but Josh Allen, to the number seven pick in 2019, has been a disappointment. So they've got to find somebody else opposite Trayvon Walker. Um, but the interior defensive line needs an upgrade as well, and and tight end, um, and a lot of that will depend too on what they decide to do with Evan Ingram in the off season. But uh, you know, it's supposedly a very very deep draft for tight end. So even if you you know are Putting that as your third or fourth priority with the Jag, you should be able to come away with a, a guy that can help you right away. But I think those are the main areas that they probably will go after, um, you know, in the draft to kind of fix this defense that just has really been a disappointment. No doubt about it. We're talking about the defense, and let's stay there and talk about somebody you, you, you did just mention, Michael, and that's Trevon Walker, who had a strip sack of Ryan Tannehill on Sunday, flashes potential once again. I think he has three and a half sacks on the season now up to this point. How do you and this – team kind of view the performance of their number one overall pick from this year who's now obviously dealing with a high ankle sprain yeah numbers wise it was never going to be impressive this season was about him learning to play outside linebacker in the nfl he did a little bit of that at georgia but when the jags drafted him that's where they said they were going to play him and uh, he's got to learn pass rush moves he's got to learn counter moves you don't just pick that up in one off season um, he's got to learn those savvy veteran tricks that pass rushers use. And he's just basically relying on his athleticism and his power at this point. And, uh, you know, last week they played him on the defensive line a little bit with his hand in the dirt. And he seemed much more explosive and a little bit more comfortable there. So they're going to kind of experiment with him and kind of move him around a little bit once that ankle is OK. Uh, and give him some more reps as a rusher from, uh, you know, along the defensive line. But, you know. The football smarts are there. The athleticism is there. The stuff you can't teach, the long arms, the power, the speed, um, all that stuff you can't teach is there. 
they've just got to figure out where the best place to put him is. So um, I knew, I think the, the Jags knew it too, that this was not going to be a big time numbers year for this kid. Uh, it was more just getting him going in the NFL. Now you can argue, should they take a guy that's a, a bit of a project with the first overall pick for a franchise that needs immediate help? Yeah, that's a legit argument to take. But um, you, you just see some flashes and you think, man, if he puts it together, he could be a dominant pass rusher in this league. Yeah, I mean, I could see it too. And you know, you mentioned what they were going to draft, uh, go for in the draft, and you talked about how much guaranteed money they had on that defense. Obviously, like guys like Smoot are going to be a free agent this year. Uh, on the other side of the ball, you have Juwan Taylor, uh, and of course Evan Ingram, and I think Dan Arnold as well. Uh, so if you think that they're going to address those p- positions possibly in the draft, what do you think they're doing in free agency and how are they going to try and make that money really work for them rather than, you know, wasting guaranteed money on, on a guy who's leading the Jaguars in sacks with only like six? I do think Smoot will be a, a priority for them to bring back because he's a very good role player and he's a guy that can play that outside linebacker spot and along the defensive line. So I think he's a guy that they do want to bring back. But, you know, you mentioned some guys offensively. I think Evan Ingram has to be priority number one. It is not a very good group of free agent tight ends, uh, at least at this point anyway. Um, You know, he's on a one-year, $9 million deal, so you don't want to bring him back at that. So you've got to sit there and convince him, hey, you know what, stay here, play with Trevor. They're building something here. And Ingram, by the way, is on pace for one of the best seasons for Jaguars tight end in franchise history and on pace to set a career high in catches too. So it's sort of been a quiet year for him, but his numbers are adding up. C.J. Beathard's a free agent. I expect them to try and bring him back. I really like him as as, uh, Trevor Lawrence's veteran backup. Um, You know, Juwan Taylor, I don't expect them to bring back. They have Walker Little waiting in the wings, and I think that's going to be their plan um, because they are tight on that cap, so they can't really spend a ton of money. Um, You know, they're 21, as of this point, it's like 21.5 million over um, in 2023, so they've got to cut some guys, and that'll get them under. But when you add in the draft class, and if you're going to try and bring Ingram back and you're going to try and bring Smoot back, um, and then you're going to try and address maybe interior of the defensive line with some of those lower end free agents because they've got a bulk up there. I mean, that money adds up pretty quick. Um, so uh, it, it's going to be tight for them. I don't think we'll see them make a big splash in free agency like they have tried at least the last several years. This Jaguars offense, Michael, is already explosive and, and pretty damn fun to watch. And I think that's going to e- improve next season with the addition of, of Calvin Ridley, who I think people are kind of forgetting about that the Jaguars will be having in tow next season. How do you envision him being incorporated into this offense next season and into this receiving core that's looking really strong already with Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, and hopefully Evan Ingram back as well? Yeah, I mean, he gives them that outside stretch the field guy. Um, which they have a little bit in Zay Jones, but not certainly at the level that right. Calvin Ridley yeah. plays at. And, and the, you know, I think in 2020, we saw he was the top five receiver in the league. And I, if that's what they're getting, they're in great shape. But they can put him outside on one side, then you have Zay Jones outside on the other. And the best part about that is that allows him Christian Kirk back into the slot almost mm-hmm. full time where he's really at his best. Yeah. Um, and then you've got playmakers at all different levels. Um, in your passing game and if you are able to bring Ingram back too and you've got that middle of the field covered then really it could be one of the more high scoring offenses in the league and and, you know look you want to give your young quarterback every single weapon you possibly can so if that's their offensive lineup next year which I think a lot of people hope um, then they ought to be pretty good and be a team that really you know should threaten in that division. I love the move of adding Ridley because as you Absolutely. mentioned there at the end, you know, these young quarterbacks, you have to empower them with weapons and schema and whatnot. We're seeing Hurts, you know, plays best football with A.J. Brown in town. We see Tua being MVP conversations with Tyreek Hill and Mike McDaniel in tow now. So I think it's awesome. I'm excited for what Christian Kirk and, you know, Ridley and that crew with Trevor Lawrence is going to do next season. Probably last question we got for you, Michael, before we let you get up out of here. Um, we saw you tweet about um, the Jaguars playoff chances at this point, standing <laughs> right at about 19.7% per ESPN's FPI. Tell me what the feeling is around this team in terms of their playoff chances running the table and obviously, you know, overtaking the Tennessee Titans for an AFC South crown. Yeah, well, a lot of the longtime Jaguar fans and longtime Jaguar people here remember 96 when they won five in a row at the end of the year to make the playoffs and then they made the run of the AFC title game. I don't think anybody expects that, but it, <laughs> it's, it's just been really weird because they've been talking about, hey, everything's in front of us yeah. um, for like the last three or four weeks. And we're sitting there going, guys, 
like you can't even beat the Texans. Well, like you can't be. <laughs> You, you guys can't beat Davis Mills, for God's sakes. Like, what are you doing? You're, you're not a playoff team. You know, you played so bad in, in London against the, the Broncos. I mean, it was just, it, we're like, it, it just was stupid to hear. But logically, they were right. Yes, it's all right in front of them. You know, so then they beat the Ravens, um, and then they go ahead and they beat, um, last week they rip, ripped the Titans in Tennessee, where it's just been a house of horrors for them. And they really are sitting in a spot where, hey, look, even if they lose to the Cowboys this week, because you kind of expect the Cowboys to go ahead and beat the Titans as well. You've got the Jets, which is a winnable game, even though the Jets defense is pretty good. Then you've got the, the Texans, which if you're playing as well as you are now, you shouldn't lose to the Texans. And then you could end up with that last game of the year, um, you know, with the Titans for the division. And, and it's, it's unlikely um, because I just, you know, this team is so up and down that I could see them beating the Cowboys and then two weeks later going to Houston and losing to the Texans because that's just kind of the way they've been all year. Um, but people around here are excited. Look, meaningful football in December in Jacksonville has not happened since 2017. So um, that's, a, you know, th the record will be what it will be. But to be honest with you, that's how they're measuring the progress in this town. Because, hey, look, the last I, I think every December since 2018, beginning in 2018, the questions have been, is the head coach coming back? Are they going to fire the GM? Is the head coach going to be fired? There's none of that this year. They're playing meaningful football. Mm -hmm. And I think Jags fans couldn't ask for anything more than that in the first year after the post or after the Urban Meyer debacle of last year. So everybody around here is incredibly optimistic. And if it falls apart and they don't even you know, have a chance at it, I think people are still excited about where the, the franchise is headed. They would have to. They would have to. And Mike, I'm sorry I misled you because I actually do have one more question for you. You said sure. something that piqued my interest on one more topic. You've been covering this team, as I mentioned, at the top since 2013, and you've seen different coaches and you know staffs come through this city and whatnot. I want to just talk about the difference between last year and this year. What's the biggest change, difference you see kind of in the team culture under Urban Meyer last year as opposed to, obviously, Doug Peterson this season? Uh, man, it, it's, it's a 180. <laughs> I mean, how much time do we – I don't know if there's enough space on Zoom to do this. Um, I mean, it, it's a functional, professionally run NFL franchise now. And you have players that, you know – Last year, they didn't want to be there. I think we've all had jobs and we've all had bosses that we just didn't like. And going to work was a chore. And you hated going to work. Well, multiply that by 53 guys on the active roster, 12 guys on the practice squad or whatever, the equipment staff, the training staff, the assistant coaches. Like, Can you just imagine what that atmosphere was like? People were miserable. Uh, the day they fired Urban Meyer, which happened at like 1245 in the morning, on a Thursday morning, December 16, uh, a day I will not forget. Um, but like you get to the facility later that day for the press conference and that, and you could just feel this huge weight lifted off of everybody's shoulders. And it was just, I mean, you didn't, I didn't feel how oppressive it was until that was gone. I mean, like we knew it was bad, but the players are, Doug Peterson's got the rep as a player's coach, but he's been hard on him when he's had to be, and these guys actually love them. I mean, Andrew Wingard, the safety, a couple of weeks ago, after they beat the Ravens, is talking about, I'd, you know, I'd run through a brick wall for that guy. You know what I mean? I'd, I'd kill for, I think he said I'd kill for Doug Peterson or something like that. Um, I mean, they look, he's a, a former NFL co player, he's a former quarterback, and he's got a Super Bowl ring. So the, all that instant credibility has sort of just permeated this locker room and the one thing he said which was really interesting at the beginning he said hey look these guys got to heal that all happened I thought that might be a year-long process but they embraced Doug Peterson mainly because they were just so happy that everything was different and and like all that healing took place in the spring I mean he, he vet mandatory minicamp he just cut all the veterans loose for mandatory minicamp they didn't even have it um so when you've got a coach that's willing to give you three extra days off and you guys can get out of there uh, they're going to be happy. And, and I just, I just can't imagine what it would be like here this year. If urban had been back and everything, we, we wouldn't be talking about Trevor Lawrence. We'd be talking about him being a bust. We wouldn't be talking about meaningful football in December. Uh, it would just be a mess. Just another example of context matters. It's hard to judge a quarterback or even a team if, you know, the coaching staff and whatnot isn't where it should be, but that's awesome stuff. And that's awesome insight. Thank you so much, Michael, and thanks so much for joining us, my man. But for Scott Proctor, Matt Morris, 
and our guy Michael Duraco. We'll catch you next time on another episode of Simple Questions. Thanks for watching. Feel free to check out our other videos and don't forget to smack that subscribe button down below while you're at it. Also, for more great and original content, head right over to bbmsports.com.